Good morning. I'm Chuck Riley, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Engineering and Computer Science, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our second leadership seminar this semester. Our speaker this morning is Mr. Oscar Rodriguez. Oscar Rodriguez has served as President and CEO of Extreme Networks since August 2010, providing strategic leadership for the company. Extreme delivers high-performance network solutions that enable the world of mob mobility, virtualization, and cloud services. Mr. Rodriguez is a communications industry veteran with more than 25 years of leadership experiences spanning product development and marketing, executive sales, and operations with, with large multinationals such as Motorola, DuPont, Nortel Networks, and Alcatel Lucent, and in key entrepreneurial leadership roles for several private high technology companies. Prior to Extreme Networks, Mr. Rodriguez served as the CEO of Movius Interactive Corporation, a mobile messaging and social media solutions company serving mobile operators, Chief Marketing Officer for Alcatel Lucent's Enterprise Business Group, and CEO of Riverstone Networks, a network company focused on delivering Metro Ethernet solutions. He also served as President of both the Enterprise Solutions Division and the Internet Data Products Division at Nortel Networks. He also served as President of Aris Interactive, a pioneer in telephony and data communication systems for cable television operators. Mr. Rodriguez is currently an investor in two leading edge startup companies delivering infrastructure solutions for electric vehicles. He serves on the board of directors for XR Corporation, a Silicon Valley semiconductor company, and on the Dean's Advisory Board for the College of Engineering and Computer Science here at UCF. He holds a, a BS in Computer Engineering from UCF and an MBA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill as well as postgraduate certificates in strategic marketing and corporate governance from Harvard Business School and Stanford Law School. This morning, he'll be speaking to us about leveraging leadership and in innovation and in entrepreneurship. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Oscar Rodriguez. <laughs> Welcome, Oscar. Thank Thank you. Uh, you know, it's really my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm a graduate of computer engineering here at UCF. And actually, when Dr. Chris Bauer, I don't know if, you know, he, he may be beyond you guys. Anybody know Chris? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Okay. So he was, uh, he was the chairman of, of that department when I got here. And um, I, as, according to him, the last time he I talked to him, he said I was the, one of the first four uh, graduates of computer engineering undergrads, right, at UCF. So it's really my pleasure to be back here. It's amazing to believe that it's been 25 years since I was here. And when I was here, there was only engineering one. Right? That was the only building there was. We didn't call it engineering one, we just called it engineering. And so, you know, the world has changed quite a bit since I was here. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about kind of how I got here, because in listening to that, you know, that bio, it does, to me it doesn't even sound like it's me, right? Because I was in your shoes 25 years ago, wondering where I was going to go to work, wondering how I could put my talents to use, uh, wondering if I was gonna make enough money to be able to pay for my apartment, wondering about all those things, right? And the world isn't all that different today from where it was then. Back then, uh, you know, it was in the 80s, uh, class, I'm class of 86, uh, and you know, the, in the 80s, uh, the, the US economy was getting through their recession, lots of hyperinflation, or inflation, I should say, uh, the economists would come after me if I said hyperinflation uh, for the U.S. But the, the truth is uh, that the world doesn't change that much. And the reason the world hasn't changed that much is because there's still a significant demand for engineers. Very significant demand for engineers. As a matter of fact, the numbers of engineers in the U.S. are absolutely insufficient to cover the numbers of jobs in the U.S. So you guys are working into a pretty good supply and demand situation. Now, it may not look that way from your standpoint, <clears throat> but it's really there. Now the question is for you guys is, how do you shape your career so that you can continue to be in the sweet spot of that demand? And because I think if you look at it from that perspective and realize that every, the world is about supply and demand, the more you can look at the skills that you can bring to the table and the more you can shape what you can do, also oriented around the things that you like to do, then you're gonna wind up really take getting value out of your engineering degree, getting value out of the things that you do, having a great and fruitful and happy life. And in the end, you know, we're only here for a short amount of time. You know, now 25 years later, I can say that, oh gee, you know, my time is running out. 
The truth is that having a happy life is really what the goal is all about. Because in the end, you will be successful if you apply yourself to the things that you do. So when I started, I started really with a little bit of a vision. I said, gosh, I really, really like stuff that moves, right? Things that work, machines that work. And so I went down the path of computer engineering because I always had this idea, and I still have the idea, that machines can be autonomous in some way. And I realized as I learned more about that, I realized that, hey, for a machine to be autonomous, it's got to have intelligence inside of it, and that means microprocessors, and that means embedded software engineering, and it means all those things. So I went down the path of saying, that's what I like to do, that's what I want to pay attention to. And then as I got involved in work, I took a co-op job here at UCF, and that co-op job allowed me to go and work with a very small company in Satellite Beach, Florida, right? Not too many companies there, right? But small company in Satellite Beach, Florida, that had a group of 10 engineers that had just left a company called ITT, and they wanted to build some communication products and actually build a little company on their own. And I, believe it or not, got to the co-op department late. And in getting to the co-op department late, all the big companies were gone. At the time, it was Martin Marietta and you know, IBM and all these big companies, and they were gone. And by getting there late, I basically applied to this little company. And it was the best thing that could ever happen to me because that little company taught me how to be an engineer because they didn't have enough people to be able to say, you guys are engineers and you guys are co-ops. They said, we need to build a single board computer. We've got a hardware guy that will build the computer. Can you write the operating system? And I said, yes. I didn't know anything about operating systems, but I knew I could take a shot at it. And so I learned a lot. And what ended up happening was when I got out of that co-op job and I went to interview for a company like Motorola, I had already I had already worked on the same processors that they were working on. And by having already worked on those processors, I did a good job at the interview because I happened to be interviewing with specific engineering types that were asking me questions about whether or not I knew embedded systems and whether or not I knew how to run the compilers. And I did. So sometimes, and what that taught me is that sometimes what you think is the wrong path winds up being the right path. Because I was really kicking myself for being late to co-op. I was really kicking myself for not being you know, at the right place at the right time, when in reality is, I was actually at the right place at the right time. So what I want to convey to you is that you can do anything you want to do. You can shape your life any way you want to shape it. The question is, what do you want out of it? So what I want to talk to you about today is you know, something I think that's very relevant. And I had a long discussion with some of the folks here at UCF about what's relevant for you guys. And what's relevant seems to be, hey, how do I get a job in, a wor in an economy like what we have today? And so what I want to talk to you about is really, how does entrepreneurial leadership, because this is a leadership, a, leadership a leadership session, right? This is about taking leadership, not just how to lead people, but how to take leadership of your own life. Because that, to me, at the end of the day, will define whether you wind up being happy or not. And so when I look at, at the world, I see, I see a world where America's trying to be relevant, right? America's wondering, where are we as a nation? We had this big advantage coming out of World War II. We really expanded the booms through multiple cycles. In the late 90s, we were the go-go technology innovators of the world. We built the internet. We did all of those things that people looked up to. And then somehow in the last 12 years, something's happened. That doesn't mean that America's become less innovative. What it means is it's time to, to regroup. And I believe it's time to really th pay attention to some of the things that we gotta get done. Now, I'm not a politician, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be political here. I'm not, gonna, not gonna talk about Democrats or Republicans or any of that stuff, right? But I, I do want to convey to you that there are ways for you to control your career and ways for you to do the things that you want to do and have the freedom to do a lot of different things. So the first thing I want to talk to you about, and this is going to look like a dry kind of, kind of situation, but 
I want to talk, first of all, about the economy. The economy needs exports. Okay, why does it need exports? I'm not gonna, this is, won't become an economics class, but if we can sell things abroad, then the money comes home. That's really what it comes down to. Okay, so and the more you sell abroad, the more money comes home. And the nation, nation gets richer. So contrast that to China, they've been selling stuff to us, and the money's been going to China. So we have to reverse that. We have to be able to create stuff that we sell abroad. And you can see here, and I'm sure you can read this afterwards, I'm not gonna go through a lot of details here, but exports boost the economy and creates an environment that the economy gets better when you export more stuff. And guess what, you guys are engineers. You make stuff that you can export. And by the way, very few other people can. You can export services, like for example, you can be an accountant and export accounting services. But that has some limitations. Even though the service is higher priced, usually than a product, what ends up happening is a service is, o is only available at based on the number of hours that you have to devote to that service. You can sell a lot of iPods and iPhones because the factory keeps cranking them out. You can automate that and you can sell a heck of a lot of them. So the volume advantage that products have have a situation where, create a situation where you can actually bring a lot of money. So if you look at this environment, right, if you look at what we're seeing here, we're really seeing where manufacturing really is the bulk of a lot of exports. And you should look at manufacturing here not because we make stuff, but because we create and design stuff, even if, they're, even if they happen to be built in a factory somewhere else. We design them, the profits come here. Apple designs products and the profits come here. They may be built in Taiwan or mainland China, but the profits come here. So exports are really important things. Small business is also important as well. And I'll let you read this, if you can read it. I'm not sure if you can, but it says here, 99.7% of all employers are really small business. And small business has a huge hand in exports, right? huge hand in exports. So when you roll all of this together and you realize that small business has a huge hand in hiring high-tech workers, and that's you guys. You guys are high-tech workers. Then you realize that small business and exports go together. So the U.S. economy needs engineers to be entrepreneurs. Engineers to start up companies. Engineers to take ideas and create them engineers to understand their markets, because it's really important to understand the market that you're selling into. We have too few engineers to fill all the gaps, like I said earlier. But sitting in here is the next Steve Jobs. Sitting in here is the next Meg Whitman. Sitting in here are the next set of entrepreneurs that are gonna take the US economy to the next level. And so when you look at it from that perspective, it's really your ideas that are the most important thing. And what getting an engineering degree allows you to do is shape your ideas into something tangible, something that you can sell, something that you can create jobs with, something that you can effectively strengthen the economy of the country by selling stuff overseas. Now in my company, we make internet equipment. This is what we do. More than 60% of all the mobile traffic in the world through iPhones, iPads, et cetera, go through our equipment at Extreme Networks. That's a lot. We're deployed in many, many phone companies around the world, whether they're in Africa or in Asia or in Russia, CIS. And so 65% of our revenue comes from overseas. That means that we have to understand a lot of things. We have to understand, for example, what those wants and needs are because they're different than the wants and needs in the US. So what's really important here is for you guys as engineers to be leaders, to be real leaders, is not just know how to build something, but know why you're building it. Know that the people who need something may have a different feature need in Asia than they do here in the US. Know the differences in language and why they're important. In essence, you gotta get embedded into the culture. So we need a new crop of bold, innovative people that are willing to take a risk, and I'll talk about that, 
But all of this and all of these logos up here are companies that started either as a garage or they started in a university lab idea. All of them. Okay? Okay, I threw Coors in there because I thought it was interesting. Okay? <laughs> Somebody, I guess, made a batch in their, in their home. So the truth is that a big company can be created just by a couple of you guys getting together and saying, we have an idea. So, who makes these small businesses? It's entrepreneurs. Fancy French word for people willing to take a risk to create a new business. Okay? That's what that's about. You have to have a dream. How many of you saw Pat Williams in January? Have you seen the YouTube video of Pat? You should see it. Because I have to tell you that it was absolutely inspirational for me. Bob sent me the link, and I thought it was amazing. The wisdom in, that, in his head, right, of all the many years of having dealt with so many people and business situations and motivational environments. The wisdom is incredible. But he started by saying you have to have a dream. You gotta be passionate about something. You can't just say, I wanna make money. Because so does everybody else. There's something that you believe in, something you really, really set you off, right? Something that you say, you know what? If I could solve this, I, I would build jobs, I would make a name for myself, I would, whatever floats your boat, right? Entrepreneurs have to have one basic characteristic. You have to have desire. And a desire that's so strong that you're willing to work 20 hours a day. And go get on an airplane and fly 20, 24 to 30 hours to get to Asia to see one customer. Because that one customer could be the difference between your success and your failure. That takes a lot of dedication. And the only way you get to that dedication is passion. So you gotta have this dream. You got to make sure that you embrace it in such a way that you don't, don't accept failure. But you have to be able to take a risk. You've got to realize that over the course of being an entrepreneur, you've got to really get in the ring and you've got to begin learning how to be an entrepreneur now. Nobody's born being an entrepreneur. It's like walking. You make mistakes, you stumble, you fall flat on your face, you bloody your nose. All those things happen when you're an entrepreneur. But the faster you get down that learning curve, then the faster you learn so you can help others. And you can be a leader as a part of a, of a small team. So you've got to, to be an entrepreneur, you can't be afraid. And you've got to be ready to fail, sometimes really miserably. You know, there's an interesting story of Walt Disney. You know, you guys heard of that guy, right? Okay. Walt Disney, at one point in time, before he got to be where he is, had failed so miserably that he, did, he didn't even have, he, he had checked in shoes to be, a long time ago, people actually, there were, used to be cobblers, and people would fix shoes, right? Now, shoes are very high volume. People rarely do that. But he didn't have enough money to get his shoes out of the repair shop. That's pretty low, right? And now look at what was built based on his ideas and his innovation. And some, sm some smart business savvy that came from the experience of having failed a few times. How many of you have heard Thomas Ed the, the famous Thomas Edison story? Over 5,000 light bulbs that didn't work. And his answer was, well, I got 5,000 experiences behind me. I know what doesn't work. That means I'm a lot closer to what, was, what do actually does work. Right? That kind of view of the world, right? That kind of view of the world that says, I have confidence in what I do. And I know that I have to embrace the learning I'm going to get because it's part of my kit bag. This is part of my tool chest. Because the next time I'm going to get, I'm going to get myself back up and the next time I'm going to use all these experiences of the failures to make it happen for me. The other thing is you have to have faith in yourself and surround yourself with people of faith. Now, this is not a religious discussion. 
Right? It's not about that. There are people that will tell you that your idea is a crock. I'm sure somebody told somebody at, at Apple, why would we want to get into the cell phone business? There's so many people there and we know nothing about phones. How many people here have an iPhone? How many have a Google or, or, or an Android phone? Okay. Android was a response to the iPhone. Okay. That idea of being able to marry computing and phones came from somebody saying, I don't care what you say, we're going to do it. Steve Jobs is a pretty smart guy. Okay. So you've got to make sure that you, you don't you surround yourself with people of faith who carry the faith with you. Because you'll find plenty of naysayers. And so birds of a feather flock together. You'll see this a lot. If you go to Silicon Valley, I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, I'm there now. Go to Silicon Valley, at every coffee shop, there are people talking about ideas, their next idea. You can hear it. Oh, let me tell you. And they're all look around, make sure nobody's listening, and then they all jot things on the piece of paper or on a napkin, right? There are probably more ideas written on those brown Starbucks napkins than probably any other medium that there is, and nobody wants to admit it. Okay? So circumstances don't make who you are. I was a poor kid. I grew up as a poor kid. I came to this country at four years of age. I was born in Havana, Cuba. I grew up in Tampa, Florida, in a poor neighborhood because we lost everything. And my dad told me this one thing. He said, because the government took everything away in Cuba. He built a business. He did done a lot of things. He was an entrepreneur, and they took all this stuff away. And he said, just remember this. The only thing nobody can ever take away from you is what's here and what's here. And so what you learn, right, is really that circumstances, no matter what they are, are all temporary. And they don't make who you are. Circumstances reveal who you are. So whatever your circumstances today, you can change that. But you've got to have an idea, and you've got to have the faith that you can make the change. The other thing is find the need and fill it. This is an old, old saying. Okay? What does this mean? It means that no one can ever fight a better mousetrap, so long as mice really is the infestation. So you got to understand that you can always get a better innovation that will supplant the establishment. But you got to really understand what the problem is and why you're doing it. Because if you don't understand the why, then the what will be wrong. When I, wh one of the things that, I, that, that forced me, that got me to move from just the pure engineering side of my career into the business side of my career, and it's taken me a long way, is I was at a startup company and we built a product that I thought was brilliant. I thought it was perfect. Why? Because I had the myopia of being the creator. I thought it couldn't be better. Then it couldn't sell. And all of us in the engineering group said, ah, oh, it must be those sales guys that don't know how to sell. Or those marketing guys that don't have the right message around it. And that actually got me to say, you know what, I, I, I want to understand this more, and that, that made me decide to go to business school. And I wound up going to business school, not because I didn't love engineering, because I do, I still today love engineering. I still want to be back on the bench and create things. That's what I love to do. But I wanted to understand the business side, and it was only later that I understood, ah, I understand all the mistakes now. And probably the first mistake is not understanding my customer, believing that myself as an engineer sitting in the back room could understand what the customer wants because it's what I would want. But that's not the way it works. You have to go to the customer, you have to go around the world if you're selling overseas and go talk to people and say, what do you like and what don't you like? Because you're trying to find, you've got to understand the need before you can fill the need. So understanding that, why you're doing something is as important as what you're doing. Because if not, well, you know, unless your intent is to have another failure so you can have more experiences. Okay? So, there are a couple of excellent books that I think I would recommend to you guys. One of them is Crossing the Chasm by Jeff Moore. 
This is a quintessential book. If you want to build any product at all, anywhere, and since you're engineers, you're probably going to build high-tech products, this is a book on the adoption of high-tech products in a market, the psychology of adoption. Why early adopters buy? You know, you can always find these gadget people, right? How many people here are what I call gadget people? People that buy something new just because it's new. Yeah, there's a few. I'm one of those two. Yeah, I'm one of those two. I've got my garage full of stuff, and I'm sure my wife says the Smithsonian's going to come call you one day because <laughs> you got everything under the sun, every flavor. I have the original TiVo from 1999. Okay. It, it, didn't even, it didn't even have a tuner. You had to connect it to a set-top box with an RS-232 cable. Anybody remember RS-232, what that is? Yeah. RS-32. <laughs> Serial cable, exactly. So if you're, there are early people that will buy anything, but just because those early guys buy it doesn't mean it's good because the rest of the people may not buy it. Okay? I will buy anything. But some of you, maybe, maybe most of you, will be much more pragmatic and say, well, that's kind of stupid. I don't want that. Right? And the psychology of how people buy and why they buy something that you build is really important. And crossing the chasm really means is that little space between something that is just an early interesting idea versus something that actually becomes mainstream and how it crosses that. <coughs> See, that's not technology, right? That's marketing psychology. But it's mixed up with technology because if you don't have the right features and capabilities and understanding, then you won't cross the chasm and your product will fall between the chasm into oblivion, right? So anybody remember Apple's first computing device that was handheld? <laughs> yeah, it was in the mid-90s. It was called a Newton, okay? Nobody remembers the Newton, but everybody knows the iPhone. Everybody knows the iPad, right? Before there was an iPad, there was a Newton. The Newton fell in between the chasm. Apple learned from that, and then they made something better but it took a while. Part of it is also understanding is the market ready for what you want, what you want to deliver as well. So crossing the chasm is good. The other one is Net Strategy by Bob Spiegel. This is about how to use the web to your advantage and how the internet, internet businesses are changing things. Really important stuff, okay? So once you're an entrepreneur, you gotta pay it forward, right? To keep the train going, you're going to have to teach others. You need to be able to be comfortable being a leader, which means that you're the one who is willing to take a risk. And there's something to be said for an old saying that says, never ask your troops to do something you're not willing to do yourself. If you're not willing to fly to India, taking four segments to get there, taking 30 hours and flying in the last seat in coach, don't ask one of your people to do it. Because if you're willing to do it, you will gain their respect and they will follow you. But always be ready to understand and keep an open mind so that the shadow of the leader really comes to bear and works in your favor. The shadow of the leader is very wide. People look at leaders and they say, gee, um, don't know what it is about that person, but I have, I have a compelling interest of following what they have to say. But as leaders, you have to maintain that moral high ground and be honest with yourself about the things you're building. If something's not going to work, say, ooh, this is not going to work. Let's regroup. Don't let your passion blind you to pragmatics. And people will follow you. So, questions? Yes, sir. So as a leader, what is one of the, the toughest decisions you, you've had to make so far? Uh, toughest decision, I think, as a leader is to say something's not working, pull the plug on it. It's very tough. It's very tough because when you have an idea and you nurture it, and it's your baby, and you know that you all these great ideas that you thought were going to play out, don't play out. You have to admit to yourself and you have to then bring your team along and get your team to understand the wisdom of saying stop doing that. It's one of the hardest things to learn because if you can realize that not all technologies work, 
Anybody remember VHS tapes here? <laughs> Anybody remember Betamax? Yeah. Okay, which do you think was the better technology? Betamax. Betamax. Oh, you, you guys have lear lear heard this before. Well, why didn't Betamax work? Pardon me? Yeah, I mean, it was really simple, right? Sony said, we want to go to market with our Sony players. And uh, the folks uh, that, Mashusta, right, which really had the VHS technology, went out and created deals with multiple brands and you know, volume overtook Betamax. Somewhere along the way, somebody had to say, okay, even in spite of the fact that this is a brilliant, brilliant technology, it's time to say no more Betamax. Or more importantly, it's time to say no more Betamax in consumer because Betamax was actually used in professional environments for many years because it had very high quality. So you have to know when to say no to something in addition to when to say yes. Because everybody's very excited when you say yes. You, pr you, know, you paint all these hockey stick charts and we're going to make a billion dollars and everybody's going to be rich and successful. Everybody has that. But sooner or later, you know, one idea out of 10 really takes off, and so you've got to be able to say no to something. That's the hardest thing, I think, in general. There are other hard things, but to me, that's one of the hardest things. Other questions? Yes? How do you participate successfully in an export market when other people try to use, uh, use practices like currency manipulation <laughs> um, and unfair trade? Yeah. Um, Currency manipulations and unfair trade and things of that nature, I, I think, are temporal things. Because I think that, in the end, things are going to wash themselves out. Somebody who manipulates currency, eventually, that becomes unsustainable. Just like, by the way, borrowing ad infinitum becomes unsustainable as well. Okay? So I think those things are unsustainable. I think the one thing that I focus on is innovation. You know, it doesn't matter if you've got old technology that's being sold really cheaply because you're manipulating currency when a new technology will give you much better productivity and will, will let, you, let you get your job done in a much better way. So the new technology will always trump the older, cheaper technology if it brings more productivity. So I focus on the innovation aspect of it. And I, I have a firm belief that innovation, at the end of the day, is the thing that will continue to drive economies and will continue to drive productivity. So I focus on creating the new stuff. And you know, I'm sure that we, we've got plenty of people to worry about the manipulation side of it. But um, you know, I think that exports, and, and by the way, today, regardless of currency manipulation, the US dollar is at a low. Right? Our, our goods look really cheap in the rest of the world. If you go to Switzerland, Swiss franc is really high. US goods look really enticing and very attractive. So currency doesn't always work against you. But I, I, I usually don't, don't worry about that. That's macroeconomic problem. My, my problem is, do I have something that the customer really, really wants? They're going to buy it. Yep. Other questions? Um, yes. I've been um, looking at some CEO statistics and stuff. I've discovered the most frequent um, degree for CEOs is an engineering, a bachelor's degree in engineering. Um, why would you say that is? Uh, great question. Uh, I think humbly, you know, as, a, as an engineer. Uh, I think that engineering teach you to, teaches you in general to think logically, right? It teaches you the laws of physics, which are all logical. It teaches you mathematics, which is all very logical. It teaches you, um, uh, it teaches you the order of things. And so as a result of that, you wind up creating patterns of order in your head. You know, and you know that you realize that even when you organize a group of people, there's a pattern of order of skill set match and different things that you have to bring together to make that work. When you're going to market, pricing and, and, and how you allocate pricing in different, different parts of the market for different types of products is also a logical set of discussions, right? Data driven, right? Uh, a lot of business is data driven, and because a lot of business is data driven, the logic of understanding how to think logically is really important, right? So I think that that's why undergraduates and engineers excel at being CEOs, is because of that. That's just my humble opinion, but that's, that's what I think. Engineering, an engineering degree taught me to be logical, and by the time I got to business school, 
They were learning statistics. I had already learned that. They were learning uh, large data sets and how to deal with large data sets. I had already learned that. They were, they were uh, learning you know, uh, mathematics of different types and I had already learned that. So it, it, it was a preparation ahead of the preparation that I needed from a business standpoint in a lot of ways. You know, and if I had to do it over again, I'd do it exactly the same way. I would not change a thing. I also wouldn't change the schools I went to either. Even if I had, you know, if I did, had to do it all over again and, and, and you know, because I, I really like personally, to me, there's a lot of value in going to a pu great public universities because you get to know everyone. You don't deal with just a small sliver of, of society. You deal with everyone. This is a huge university and you get the diversity in this university is incredible. And as a result of that, you get to know people in addition to getting to know things. And by getting to know people, you then get to a better sense of what sells and what doesn't sell, what you can create and what you shouldn't create. And you build an incredible network. And one of the things that, that I, would, I would also recommend to you is maybe it, you don't appreciate it now because I didn't appreciate it as much how the networking of people that you know will invariably make or break your ability to get ideas adopted. Knowing people and being able to have a trusted group of people that you can go to and ask questions and bounce things off of and a mentor that you can go to and have a discussion regarding you know, what you're doing and what your problems are, that's really important. I think that the more you can get, you can interact with people the better off you are in terms of anything that you want to create to sell. So if you want to be a researcher back in the lab and that's all you want to do, that's a different story. And you could probably create incredible patents and you know, have your name as a, you could be a Nobel laureate and never have to worry about networking with people. But if you want to be an engineer and produce products and export them and, and, and really drive the economy and be a relevant part of the economy, then I think you have to understand how people work, build your network, and build it wide and globally. Questions? Other questions? All the way at the end. All the way at the end. I, I cannot see. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, what do you feel about the current state of like the patent system? Because I know we have a lot of like patent lawsuits going on. Do you think <coughs> that will shake out? Will it continue to stifle? Um, <coughs> anything that's regulatory, and the patent system is regulatory, uh, anything that's regulatory takes time to resolve. Right, so yes, I think eventually it will shake itself out. The question is how many years does it take? Um, the, the, uh, you know, my opinion, this is just my opinion. Uh, the patent system was designed to protect inventors so that they could actually, you know, after inventing something great, be able to, to use that to their advantage because they, they brought the idea and it was inherently unfair to have someone go through the painstaking efforts of inventing something only to have somebody quickly copy it, right? The problem is it's been, uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, and, and I would say perverse a little bit, right? You have now people that can buy and sell patents, right? Which a patent is a piece of real estate, so to speak. It's an asset. You can buy it and sell it. But now you have people who can buy patents that don't have any intention of using the patent. Instead, what they have an intention of doing is suing somebody else for using the patent when they themselves are not going to use it. So from my point of view, I, I would love to see a change in the patent system that says, if you're not going to use a patent, then it, it sh you should not be able to pursue someone. Because if you can eliminate that, then you can eliminate what, you know, these groups of lawyers that get together to sue folks just because they own the patent. And, uh, you know, it's, I know it's controversial, don't get me wrong. But I think that that would change the landscape significantly. And you know, it would keep the, uh, what the industry has known, what us in high tech call patent trolls, right? <laughs> from, uh, from acquiring a bunch of patents and then saying, now I'm gonna go extract my pound of flesh because I bought these patents on the cheap and now I'm gonna turn them you know, into, into lots of money. And I think it's really, it's, it's a, it's a pall, it, it places a pall on the economy, right? It's removing Rem it's, it's removing value from the economy rather than allowing the economy to go forward. So, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Yes? Uh, how do you, what do you do to 
to change the way you approach a different culture when you're trying to make a potential partnership in you know, Bangladesh or in other places? How do you change what you do? Great question. You know, um, you're only born in the culture you're born in. So everything else is learned, right? That's the first thing you have to, you have to embrace, right? Everything else is learned. Uh, you, can, you can read about things. You can Google things, right? Um, I was laughing with a good friend of mine not too long ago where when I, when I was in engineering school, I, w I told him that I was coming here. And I told him when I was in engineering school, we had these big giant books called CRC manuals. Anybody know what a CRC manual is anymore? Yeah, okay. Well, now it's called Google, right? <laughs> now you have everything, not just engineering stuff, right, uh, at your fingertips. So you can read about a lot of things, but, and, and I think that's good preparation, but I think you also need to live it, okay? Because you don't really understand what, how people think and how they live and the things that are important to them until you sit down and, and you talk to them. And a lot of cultures around the world, right, having a meal with someone is everything. Sitting down and having lunch, a cup of coffee, dinner, whatever. It lets you interact because you get to know about their families. You get to know about what they do for hobbies. You get to know about all those things in addition to having a discussion about business. And you get to understand how they think. And that is the most important thing. So the first time you go anywhere, you're a novice. The second time you go, you at least have one experience already behind you. And you build your repertoire of experiences over time. So, and, and there's another thing as well is you get gut feels about how to deal with situations, right? You, you, um, your intuition begins to take shape. You know, when I, when I was your age, <laughs> I sound like my father now. When I was your age, <laughs> I, I thought the world was simply data-driven and that's the way you should care about the world, right? Things are facts and things are black and white, et cetera. And uh, I didn't appreciate something that I appreciate today a lot more, and that's in the intuition and because intuition is really your subconscious working on data, because you've had a lot of experiences, and you know, you've heard the term, you've, I've seen that movie before, you know how the plot's gonna work out, your subconscious tells you those things. So you can very quickly, and it processes a lot faster than your conscious mind does, I believe. So very quickly you get a gut feel and you say, okay, that's not gonna go the right way. It's because of all these experiences that you've built up. So that's why one of, you know, one of the, one of the decks, chart decks that I had up here said, get in the ring, get in the game, because the more you can get experiences early, the more you will build your repertoire of knowledge that then becomes part of your subconscious. And you'll be able to make calls a lot easier. Okay. So you don't know cultures, but you'll learn them. But the only way to learn them is you gotta go there. Yeah, great question. So um, the best place to get money are, are, are people that you trust, right? And people that trust you, by the way, because someone's going to give you money and the money may not work out. So someone's going to have to trust you as well. Um, you're going to, you have to build up, over time, you'll build up enough experience and knowledge where many more people will trust you than they would initially with their money. Venture capitalists, you know, their, their job is to take a risk on people. But they're smart, right? They don't take a risk on anybody. They usually take a risk on either ideas that they think are brilliant and, you know, with the, with the understanding that they will supplement you even if you're young. They'll supplement you with, with other people because they're willing to put some investment in this idea. That certainly happens a lot. Happened a lot in the late 90s. In the late 90s, you saw, you know, 24-year-old CEOs. Um, and so, because the web was young and a lot of things were young, and today, I think the world is such where you can actually become an entrepreneur using mechanisms that have already been supplied. I mean, how many, anybody here made a, an iPhone or an Android app? One? One, two, three, okay. Handful of you, right? Okay, so, you know, I, I have a friend in California whose, whose son <laughs> created an app that's just basically knock-knock jokes. 
And those knock-knock jokes, it was very simple. I mean, you downloaded the, web, the, uh, the development kit from Apple, and it was $99 or whatever it is, and learn how to on, in the spare time how to do it. And um, in those knock-knock jokes, uh, then connected it to Apple's advertising. <laughs> and now the, the, the app is free. He gets paid for advertising. Gets paid money, right? So you have ways of developing cash flow today that you didn't have in, in the past because of the fact that these things are available to you. My fellow investors and I have a, have a saying that we use, um, usually it's, what we use is called uh, buy on risk, sell on news. Um, <laughs> the question to you is, do you technically believe in that statement and why? And if, if not, how would you change it? Um, no, I, I, think, I think that certainly the buy on risk aspect of it is true. Sell on news, I think the question is, which news do you sell on? Right? But I think buy, buy on risk is, is correct because I think that there's a lot of opportunity in, in, in chaos. Right? Whenever you see markets in chaos, there's opportunity there because something's not going right for someone, which means that someone, their customer, has a pain that you can go solve. Right? Whether it is you know, SUVs that use too much gas and now petroleum is very high, so gasoline is very expensive. So if I want to go create an electric vehicle, might be a pretty good time to do it. Of course, electric vehicles are one of these capital intensive things I talked about, which is creating a car is a big deal. Right? So, but you can see that, that the chaos that brought about by sudden increases in petroleum prices then create an environment that opens up the door for opportunity. So I think buying on risk, meaning buying in that chaos cycle is a good thing. You get your, your, your job is to figure out what to buy into. But selling on news, I, I don't know about that because the, the, the real question is, which news? Do you sell as soon as someone se issues the first good statement? Or you hear the first piece of good news and say, okay, I've made enough, let me get out? Or do you, do you let it go higher? If you had bought Apple in 2004 and then sold in 2005, you might have missed a big wave. So it's it the, the sell part is what you have to think about, and only you can determine what's your level of risk of how far you let something go. But I do believe that the buy on the chaos, buy on the risk aspect of it makes sense. Okay. Yes? Uh, my name's Jimmy. And, um, hey, Jimmy. I, I guess I've heard you s continue to say um, it's always about catering to the market. But what if it's you really want to change the market, change the society that the market is based on? I mean, have you ever tried something? Yeah, so a lot of people do. It, it's, it's, so it, there's a very simple two, sort of two-dimensional matrix that you'll, you'll see, you know, the, if you divorce yourself for a moment from what product you're making, because it could be pizzas, right? Um, so it doesn't have to be high tech, but it just applies to products is, you know, the, on one side of the matrix is new, new market, existing market. On the other side is new product, existing product. If you have a, an existing product for an existing market, then that's pretty safe. I'm going to just create another variation of another variation of an SUV, another variation. Yet, you know, now I'm going to add Hawaiian pizza in addition to pepperoni pizza. Right? It's pretty standard. Uh, so it's very low risk. New product for an existing market is where you look for a need. The market's already there. Look for a need. And you figure out what the competition's not doing right, and you go in there and add a new product for the existing market. To to meet somebody's need. The ri and that's got a higher level of risk than existing product for existing market. The highest level of risk is really new product, new market. Because you've got a brand new product and you've got a market that may not even know that it needs a product. It's got the highest risk, but usually the highest reward. Right? I mean, a lot of people will argue that an iPad is, <laughs> is a product that nobody even knew, knew they needed. Everybody had a laptop. They had a phone. People were either on their smartphones, right, with a magnifying glass sometimes, looking at the web, <laughs> or they were on their laptop, you know, in a more, you know, sitting down position, et cetera. But it was the introduction of the iPad that people said, oh, wow, <coughs> this iPad stuff is pretty catchy. But it took somebody to say, hey, I'm going to build something new because I think this is necessary. Now, remember what I told you about the Newton? They had it in the back of their head a while back ago, and they knew what failed, right? They analyzed what failed, 
And I'm sure they learned a lot from that. Okay? So remember, the first time it doesn't always go well. So you've got to be ready for that. That's the risk, right? Newton versus iPad. And they're almost 10 years separated. Actually, more than that. More like maybe a dozen years separated. So it's higher risk, but usually higher reward. Because if you're first to market in a category, that you always have the first to market advantage. If you read Crossing the Chasm, it's a great book. You, you, it, it covers a lot of this. And because anybody who's first to market usually drives down the cost curve faster, which means you can lower your prices accordingly and continue to stay competitive ahead of the, the person who's number two or number three into the market. Okay? But, it, but new product, new market carries the most amount of risk, but the most amount of reward typically. So yeah, I've done both and they have different levels of risk. And it depends on what your customer needs at that point in time. Do they need something radical or do they need something that is an ev incremental evolution of what's already been there because what they've got is pretty much in the right ballpark but not quite good enough and you can, you can make it better. Two different things. Yep, yep. Um, well, when Mr. Riley was speaking, he said that you're part of an, entre or part of an entre entrepreneurial um, <coughs> venture for electric vehicles. Yeah. I've noticed that there's been some failures and stuff with them. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about where they're going, because they must be pretty positive. If they're in yeah. Um, so I, I do think that electric vehicles ha are now gaining momentum and, enough and, cr er, and don't have critical mass yet, but are on their way. The reason is because no matter what turmoil there is in the world markets, petroleum goes up and down. And it, the, it also has, I, I also like to think of it as something that has, you know, it w with a lot of changes, especially large changes like transportation changes, don't discount the political environment and whether something is, will be acceptable or not acceptable in, a, in society. And I think that whether you are an environmentalist and you want to control pollution, and you want to control you know, spills in the Gulf, et cetera. Right? Or whether you are someone who wants to disassociate the US from a dependency on foreign oil, electric vehicles solve both those problems. Okay? So it's got good political capital around it. That's one. The other thing is that it can create an inflection point to get the US back into automobile manufacturing wholesale. Right? At by developing a different kind of vehicle, right? So that, and it's dependent on battery technology, it's dependent on a lot of new innovations to make it work. But, uh, so I'll tell you the venture that, that I've got, I've got an investment in two ventures, not in the vehicles themselves, but in the infrastructure for charging them, okay? So the infrastructure for charging them is, you know, <coughs> it's one thing to be GM, it's another thing to be the gas station. Because every car needs a gas station. Okay? So, you know, and that, that, that's going to change the paradigm of the way we think, right? We're used to going, and because of the volatility of gasoline, everybody doesn't have a gas station in their house, right? They're not going to permit you to do that, right? You know, leakage, environmental concerns, you might blow the neighborhood up, all kinds of reasons <laughs> why people don't have gasoline, you know, sitting in their homes. So, there's a special place that we go that's specially permitted to go keep gasoline and everybody's used to going over there and gassing up and it takes 10 minutes and then off you go for a week, right? The paradigm of electric vehicles is gonna change things because one, you don't have to go to a special place, but also the charging takes more time than 10 minutes. Now they're trying to solve that, right? They're trying to get 440 volt chargers and all that great stuff, but that, creates an environment where you gotta change the electric grid. Well, that's usually, if you gotta change big things like the electric grid, that's probably not gonna be a good, you know, it's gonna take a long time to do that. So usually 220 chargers are gonna let you charge a car in about 60 minutes or so, to an hour and a half, depending on the size of the battery. That's long enough to go have lunch. That's long enough to go to a Starbucks and get half a charge, right? So what you're gonna see is the way people fuel electric vehicles will change, because it's no longer going to one place to go put a bunch of gas in, now it's no matter where you work and play, outside of your apartment complex overnight, and, you, and because you can program them to, to effectively turn on when the electricity is the cheapest, like at three o'clock in the morning, you can come home, connect it, go to sleep, 
It turns on at 3 o'clock in the morning when the electricity is the cheapest, and then you get the least amount of cost out of charging. And by the way, electricity is already about a tenth the cost of gasoline, anyway, to fill up your car for the same about a mileage, right? So that transformation will happen. And so my decision was, OK, cars are big risk, and I don't know which one's going to win. And I'm, you know, I'm not a car guy. I don't know how to make a car. I can make a charging station. That stuff I know how to do. Yeah, actually, in Orlando here, uh, one of the companies I've got investment in is the distribution for, for charging stations for one of the manufacturers in the southeast. And actually, OUC, right, Orlando Utilities Commission, is installing those charging stations in multiple places in Orlando. Yep. What kind of liabilities do you have with something like that with people getting shocked? Well, first of all, you've got to make a good product, <laughs> OK? And it's got to be UL approved, right? Um, you know, I, liability is you know, the same as any other high voltage product you create. And the way, it, yeah, and believe me, when you design things for automobiles and for general consumer, there's a lot of regulatory things that you have to pass. So like, for example, the, the connector, you know, was designed and specified by the Society of Automotive Engineers, right? It's a common connector. So that all the cars will have, you know, the, the, the mated female side in the car, and then there's the male side that plugs in, in into, the, uh, into the car. And until it makes contact, the pins are offset, so until it makes contact, nothing flows. So you can't pull it out and shock yourself with it, right? A lot of these things, right? And, but, you know, to me, the, the, the litmus test is if, uh, and this is what I told the design engineers, here's, here's your criteria. Criteria is if it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon in Miami, raining cats and dogs, and a lady gets out of the, her car with holding a baby and an umbrella, can she plug it in, standing in a puddle, can she plug it in and be safe? If you can pass that criteria, then you've probably covered most of the bases. So once again, right, it's really understanding what you're going to build, right? This is, not, this is not a pristine place that's completely dry. You've got to be ready for all the environments. You know, what, up north, you've got, to be, you've got to be ready that you're going to have a lot of ice storms and this charging station will be covered with ice. If you notice, a lot of gas stations have you know, roofs over them because of this. Well, if you locate a charging station outside of a Starbucks, or actually Buffalo Wild Wings here in Orlando, you can go to the Buffalo Wild Wings and, and see them, right? They're not gonna, you don't have the luxury of having roofs over everything, although there's a couple of places where solar panels are being put with the charging station to be able to make it carbon neutral, right? So, because you don't have that luxury, you got to make sure that, you know, the ice can fall off of it and all those great things. So the good thing is an electric charging station, you can do a trickle charge and warm it up and the ice falls off of it. Lots of things you can do. I think I'm going to get the hook. Well, let's thank Mr. Rodriguez.